Hi, I'm Dawn Damari, and you're listening and watching A Teaspoon of Healing. We are now on YouTube as well, and you can get it on all your podcast platforms. So today, I'm very honored to have a guest with me, Paula Smith. Paula is an intuitive healer, and she specializes in inner child healing. So hi, Paula. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I'm excited about being here today. Thank you so much for being a guest. And thank you for sending your bio. We're going to talk a little bit about your experience. But first of all, um, do you mind sharing a little bit about the background about what you do to our listeners? Sure. So I got to the point in my healing journey where I knew that I was going to be able to use what I was doing to help other people. And a couple of pieces that resonated with me the most were mindfulness and inner child healing. So that's kind of like the basis of what I do. I like helping people get to the root of what's causing blocks and negative patterns that are playing out in their lives unconsciously and give them, help them create a safe space with my assistance to kind of go back there and heal and remove those blocks and patterns so they can start living well, thriving in their lives. Wonderful. And that's, that's really needed. And there's, a lot of talk about inner child healing and I'm really interested in it. And it's just so important because, and we talked about this a little bit before we started recording is that we will keep repeating the same patterns until we heal that. Some of these inner child mm -hmm. wounds, that inner child that lives when all lives inside all of us. So in your bio, you talked about spending 15 years in a narcissistic abusive relationship. So before we talk about this and your journey to healing, what is narcissistic abuse for people who don't know what that is? It is the, there's a pattern. There's usually like a trauma bond. So there's a pattern of usually the person comes on really strong we can call it love bombing. Um, they show you their best version and they usually try to rush things along. My guess is so that they can keep the mirror up for as long as they can to kind of pull you into their web and their world. And um, then kind of once they get you in, whether it's unconscious or not, depending on kind of what kind of a narcissist they are and their wounding, they will start to gaslight you, dismiss you, kind of like push you away, pull you back when they need you. And it's, it's a very traumatic and really hard thing to understand while you're in it. And it's a, the trauma bond is very strong. You become bonded to them become addicted to the cycle so um, on average it takes about seven times for someone to leave it took me three times and so one of the things I do is help people kind of raise awareness and give them su the support so that if someone is wanting to leave they can kind of I guess gain the tools and be ready so that they're more successful they have a like higher success rate in leaving and are more ready for it and prepared to what's going to happen when they do leave because there's a lot that happens that we don't really understand in our bodies and our nervous system which causes which is the reason a lot of people go back because they're not prepared for what's going to happen okay and now you had mentioned the trauma bond so what is a trauma bond for for people who haven't heard of this it's that cycle it's that addictive nature that um our nervous system gets used to it's that the addiction to the ups and downs, the, the hits of dopamine mm -hmm. and stuff that are going on from the hot and cool, the, the back and forth, the, the highs and the lows. Um, and, and before we know it, we're addicted to the cycle. And maybe the other part of it is maybe we see where they're wounded and maybe we're wounded too, like from our childhood or whatever. So we make exceptions to some of the abuse and some of the toxic behavior because we see that. So you combine those two things and it can really keep you trapped in a relationship. Okay. And yeah, and you, like you said, it's an, I've heard this before that it's, it's an addiction. It's, it's, oh, it's, it's powerful. It's definitely it's like, an addiction. I would say, I would say it's definitely as addictive as like narcotics and drugs and yeah. stuff like that. Yes. And part of it, I'm assuming is also the, uh, like you said, the push and pull, the hot and cold, because it's like, almost like gambling, I guess, in a way it's like, you know, sometimes you'll, you know, I'm not a gambler, but you hear about this sometimes mm -hmm. like on a slot machine, sometimes you'll get like the three bars or whatever, and you'll, you'll win. And then sometimes 
you don't. And it's like, they'll sometimes give you, they'll give love bomb you, put so much love mm-hmm. on you. And then sometimes they're just totally, either totally cold or discard you. Um, so you don't know what you're going to get. And I, I think that they play on that to, to, to make it addictive. Well, exactly. I mean, they've showed you that version of you. So you keep wondering, you saw that for maybe like three months straight, maybe they were able to hold up that mask Mm -hmm. and show you that version. So it causes like cognitive dissonance, because you're wondering where that person is. I mean, they showed you that version of themselves. And if we're if we're wounded, and we have childhood wounds, there's a likeliness that we're going to hold on to waiting for that version, and we're not able to be strong enough to realize what the situation is. Okay. Yeah, very true. Now, but do you mind sharing a little bit about what you went through in your relationship? Sure. So with my situation, I actually knew him for a while um, before we, like we were friends before. Um, I thought I knew him, but what I can see is that they can be very good at showing you what they want to. They're, you know, they can be really careful about that. It wasn't very long. I think I was only in the relationship for a year before I ended up on like antidepressants and anxiety medicine, thinking that it was like me not being able to hold things together. I mean, I was like raising two boys at the time too. Um, He had children that were older and causing a lot of issues because they were grown. They grew up with him as the father. So they Mm. had their own wounding and stuff. So it was a very drama filled household. And within like years, I was a mess, but I was just caught in it. And I did not, I was not, I was very wounded myself. Um, I didn't feel strong enough. I didn't understand it. I felt weak. Um, There was a lot of shame, you know, like I said, I left three times. So you reach out to people, you leave, you look for support, you go back. There's a level that we like kind of isolate each time we do that because we don't understand it. And we don't think anyone else is going to understand it. So you like start kind of pushing people away so that you can cope. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a, yeah, it was. And for myself, like um, we lost his son while we were together to a drug overdose. So, so to talk about like trauma bonds and stuff like that. I mean, it just makes it even like, I remember thinking to myself, like, how do you leave someone now that's lost their son? Like, so mm-hmm. it took, it mm-hmm. took a lot to get me to the, and I mean, part of it is, um, I wouldn't say like my parents weren't, it wasn't like a narcissistic abusive relationship, but when I was younger, it was very volatile and traumatic. So there's an amount of normal that as long as say my, my ex, the, the, my partner wasn't as abusive as my dad, he was okay if that makes sense like right. if he didn't physically abuse me because he never touched me or whatever so you know it's not as bad so it's just like our childhoods have a very big effect on our relationships when we get older on how we gauge what's right from wrong what's normal what's safe okay and then how did you end up leaving you had said it takes an average of about seven times to leave but for you it was it was it three was times. three yeah so Um, I would say about two years before I left, I left one time, like I left the second time I went back, but I started therapy and I started meditating and meditation was the thing that really changed everything for me because it gave me the awareness to see what I was doing in the relationship, stop the cycle of like the, the gaslighting and stuff. So Mm -hmm. I was finally able to watch what he was doing and quit reacting. So I wasn't playing out out into the cycle anymore. And that actually made him crazier for a while. Mm -hmm. So it was a good thing that I was like grounded and meditating like a couple times a day because I just kind of watched it. And yeah, eventually I kind of just, for one thing I had to start saving money because that was one thing is they're very good at like cutting you off and isolating you, but also like financially. So he made it so that I was financially dependent on him. Well, he didn't make me, but he, he created scenarios to where it worked out. Like within, I think six months, he was like, you can quit your job. You could stay home with the boys, stuff like that. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then when it's time to break free, it's that adds to, I think a lot of women too, that, you know, how am I going to do this all on my own, let alone like what's happening in the nervous system and stuff. How am I financially going to make this move 
Yes. So I started saving money, um, building credit and stuff. Um, I didn't have a lot of money when I left. I definitely had like a big change in lifestyle. I went from not having to worry about finances to living in a travel trailer with like holes in the floor and stuff like that. That was about a year before I was able to get out and get a suite of my own that was comfortable and cozy. And, but I mean, it really, when you go through stuff like that, and that was like during COVID too, you really Uh learn what you're made of. And there's a strength Mm -hmm. that comes from that, that you take forward that takes a lot to wrap, rock you. takes a lot to rock me now when you've gone through all of that, for sure. Absolutely. And And thank you for sharing that. It's very powerful. And, you know, that you brought up a couple good points too, but also about the finances and him saying, okay, you can stay home and then you don't have to worry about money, but then you, it puts a lot of women and, and, and men, because it could happen to men too, to, they feel trapped. Mm-hmm. And like you said, you, it took a year, you were in the, in the trailer, travel trailer, and it took a year to get, get a suite of your own, but it was just still so worth it to, to get out of there and oh, um, for sure. get away from the abuse. Um, now, when people are with a narcissist, why do you find that they must, we feel that we must constantly prove their worth? Now, this could be a partner, it could be a, you know, a parent, a friend, what, the proving of why the, do we the have, worth. Yeah, why do what, we have to prove our worth? Yeah, or what, yeah, why is there is this thing, this feeling, and I, I've heard about it, or just dealing with people that, now, I don't know if they're diagnosed as narcissists, but, you know just assuming there's this proving, proving yourself kind of jumping through hoops to maybe be accepted. I would say that's where the inner child wounds come in our childhood, maybe dynamics that played out with our parents or whatever. Um, Maybe we, because in the first, this first seven years of our lives, especially we, that's where we come up with our ideas on ourselves and what we have to do, like the subconscious patterns and behaviors too. So Like, for example, say my dad was never home or say he left my mom at a really early age. I can internalize that. It was because I wasn't good enough or because he didn't love me or like situations like that. Right. And so when we're at that age, if we develop the idea that we got to try harder, we got to people, please, we have to Mm -hmm. give more, we have to be more that starts playing out in our relationships unconsciously. We don't know, like it took me a long time to make those connections okay so the inner child wounds so how can we identify these like you had mentioned the inner child wounds it keep it kind of it keeps coming up and it's obviously that's what you specialize mm-hmm. in so you know how do we identify which ones they are and within ourselves just realize that a lot of it's um it's coming from our own wounds Yeah, well, it's a little bit tricky, but I would say um, triggers are a really good guide. So when we're triggered by something and we're reacting and we're hurt, um, maybe look back at, is that a pattern with us? Is that something that keeps coming up with like other people or different scenarios? And look back into our childhood and see. So if it's like people pleasing, maybe you're a people pleaser and that keeps playing out in your life. You keep saying yes to too too much or saying yes to things that aren't for you and which creates you to kind of be in relationships that aren't authentic and you're not being authentic, right? Mm -hmm. Um, That could go back to depending on what played out in your childhood with your parents or whoever, maybe even teachers, like that's the thing. It doesn't have to be parents. Um, we develop the idea that we have to make people happy in order for us to be happy and safe. That was one of my things. I felt like if I could create um, a household or a relationship where he would finally be content, that he would relax and I would be able to relax in a relationship. So that was part of the dynamics that played out with me. Is if I thought if I could keep everything chill and stable and then he wouldn't like erupt and make things challenging for everyone. Right. Mm -hmm. And I developed that as a child. So there's an example right there because, because of the dynamics that played out in my parents, I was the one that, um, for one thing, I tried to stay out of the way a lot. Mm -hmm. That was like one of my coping mechanisms. Yeah. And the other thing is to be like, I was the really good kid. So I didn't cause any problems. I was quiet. I tried, you know, just trying to make things easier. So we will kind of relive those patterns and then 
the triggers are really guides, like what we feel triggered by. Those are guides to potential inner child wounds. That's how I, I, yeah, I definitely, it's a, it's a hard thing to kind of wrap the head around, but they are a very good guide and tool once we're ready. And it's not always easy to do it on your own. That's why I think it's like, if you can find someone to work with, it can be helpful for someone to hold space for you while you do it, because this is like our deepest work, right? And when you're helping people who've gone through this, whether, you know, again, a relationship, family, relationship, friendship, how can, how can you help them, you know, find out those wounds and, and kind of heal them? I'm sure it's a, it's not easy just to describe very quickly or anything, but cause that's like, that's no, your life's I think work, it's, but... it's creating this, it's creating the space for them to be safe, to just like talk mm-hmm. and, you know, talk about the, maybe they're just talking about the triggers and I can kind of like guide them. Like, I'm not like telling them where to go, but I can kind of work with them in that way. And one thing is kind of let them gain awareness by even like talking and the conversations that we have, bringing awareness to it is one of the first things that I do um, because awareness is huge. Once you, you can't necessarily like stop a cycle with awareness, but definitely is like one of the first steps. Um, and then the other thing is creating a safe space where they finally maybe feel comfortable sitting with the feeling that is originally trying to come up from childhood because until we can actually like sit with it and feel it and like see what it feels like in our body, maybe we can stop repeating it and doing that thing that we always do to cope, Mm -hmm. whether that's the people pleasing or the running away or the fixing or whatever it is that's playing out in our life. Um, So I try to, eventually that's one of the things we do is teaching them to feel safe enough to sit with it and let it come up because that's how we can finally start healing it. So yeah, that's part of the process. Okay. And I assume it's probably brings up a lot of things for people that maybe they forgot about within their childhood. Like, oh, I didn't remember oh, this. For sure. Like okay. for myself, I blocked out a lot of my childhood. I didn't realize it until I was like in my forties mm-hmm. because I started talking to my sister and I realized that she remembered way more of our childhood than I did. Like way more. And she's younger than me which didn't add up to me. So I started looking into it and I learned that trauma causes a lot of people to like not have childhood memories and stuff. So, which made me even more curious. Right. And so as I start unraveling and as people do, usually slowly things start coming up. So it's, there's like layers of it, but I do feel like our body only brings up as much as we can handle at a time. And that's why it comes up in layers. So you know, maybe like a little bit will come up. And then as we heal it, a little bit more will come up, kind of seems to happen like that. Okay. And you had mentioned meditation. So that really impacted your life. It looks like you had said, when he was doing certain things, you could meditate and meditating helped you not react. It seems like reacting is is a big part of the, the narcissist cycle, it feeds into it, not that it's anybody's fault to react it's it's not not no no blame there but some meditation can help that oh I would say well because like I said awareness is one of the first steps in any of this whether it's like healing from the abuse or healing our new child awareness is always key so being able to be present enough and and grounded enough to sit with whatever is playing out and watch it become the watcher is huge Mm -hmm. like honestly it saved my life like because things were getting really really bad for me at the time And so, yeah, definitely meditation, even if it's like, you know, short, that's the thing is it can be hard for people to accept meditation. It's Mm -hmm. one of those things that you can't really shove down someone's throat, but even like lit, like seriously, like five minutes at a time, you know, however, say you're a couple times a week, you were to commit to that. But if you, once you get to the point to where you could do like five minutes a day, that starts really being life changing. I like how you said that. So even five minutes twice a week to start and then just five minutes a day is life changing. Well, Cause yes, meditation can thing really is, be hard for people to, to, to get into. Cause they just think, Oh, I can't do it. I can't sit still for five minutes. Well, the other thing is that there are more than one kinds of meditation too. So right. there's like walking meditation mm-hmm. and stuff, which is, 
I didn't realize that I had always kind of been doing that. Like when you're out in nature, it's actually a little bit easier to be more connected. Mm-hmm. And maybe so you're just like kind of walking and like paying attention to your breath or whatever. So those are another easy way to kind of get comfortable and get started. I like that. The I've heard of that, the walking meditation, because I'm also someone that if I'm sitting still, all I'm going to do is think about my to-do list and distracted <laughs> stuff in the house. But walking in nature, yeah, you can well, turn off my music. That's the thing. I'm always listening to music, but to just turn that off and listen to my breath or my heartbeat. I'm going to try that. Guided meditations were really helpful for me too. That was how I started out. And okay. even now, if I was feeling challenged, like I was having like some racing thoughts about something, I would go back to the guided meditations because they kind of give you something more to focus on. If you have like a a monkey mind, Mm -hmm. you've got a lot going on up there. So the guided meditations can really help too. And and those are so Mm -hmm. accessible. Um, So many apps that have those now and um, people that are offering that. Mm -hmm. I've actually just created an inner child healing meditation. It's not up on my bio yet, but maybe by the time this comes out, I'll have that done. So it'll be like a free, a link that, people can check out. Oh, okay. Yes. That would be wonderful. I'll put that in the the show notes. It'll probably be available by the time it comes out. So people Mm -hmm. that are watching now, (laughs) you can, you can find that and that's wonderful. It's going to help so many people. So with these wounds, um, these inner child wounds, as you find that your people are healing through it, I assume that this is just going to lead to a lot of profound healing and maybe we won't attract toxic people to us. And I don't really like to label people as toxic, but you know, I'm just going to say it because it is uh, what it is. <laughs> because we had talked before the recording and you said that after leaving the relationship, you hadn't done the full, he- you know, inner child healing yet. So you attracted a best friend who mm-hmm. also was toxic or narcissistic. Well, that's the thing. So that's why I think it's important to heal after these relationships, because I'm sure a lot of people have heard it. There's that person that ends up in an abusive relationship after abusive mm-hmm. relationship, whether it's romantic or not. Um, so if we have those wounds in us, it's like having a hole in us or like a puzzle piece or puzzle pieces that are missing. And if they're not whole, we accept a lot more unhealthy things from people without even knowing it. It's unconscious. But what okay. it is, a part of it is we're looking things for outs- outside of us to fulfill us, to validate us, to give us comfort, to soothe, instead of being able to do those things on our own. And that's where inner child healing comes in because you finally connect with yourself enough to give yourself those things. Oh, I see. So it's this, um, instead of seeking the external validation, people can learn to validate themselves instead. And then those kind of um, toxic people or whatever it is, those will either those relationships won't be attractive to us, whatever kind of relationship, and just maybe the people will avoid us. Yeah, well, that's the thing. I think they, I think narcissists usually are very, they can see kind of who might work or be, mm-hmm. you know, that they can work their way into their lives or whatever. I think if we're wounded, we can show we're, we're wounded with us really knowing they've, I mean, they've been that their way their whole life likely. So it's something that they're able to pinpoint probably without too much effort. Okay. And um, yeah, once we clear up those wounds, um, it, they naturally, so that was what happened with me. I left the relationship. Um, I was still in the friendship for a few years, but as I healed, it just got to the point where I just couldn't tolerate it. I saw everything for what it was. And I mean, again, they don't show themselves for who they are right away either Mm -hmm. and develop or depending on our level of awareness, whether or how quickly we see things for what they are. Okay. So yeah, I, I tried different things. I tried communicating, I tried boundaries and it just got to the point where it was just like, it just wasn't something that I could keep doing. Like my body just kept resisting it, resisting it. So you said, said mm-hmm. that, so the, our bodies can sometimes even get sick, I guess, when we're going through abuse or the body will just feel when something isn't right. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing is, is when we're wounded, we can get like, I was very out of touch with my body. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we can become disconnected as children and it's almost like shut off. Like I was, I had no idea what my body was doing. And I mean, and that's the thing, instead of doing the healing work, a lot of us, we go to the doctors, we get on all these different medications and stuff and anything, they can disconnect us in certain ways, even more from ourselves. Um, Yes. So yeah, it's important to get the right help at those times and not to say that none of that was helpful 
because I know of course they can definitely help you of know course. what I mean slow down the waves and make things more tolerable so that we can heal Yes, of course, of course. But yes, it can manifest in, in physical stuff. And not that there's anything wrong with taking medications, but healing those wounds can really just kind of help it heal ourselves. Yeah. And mm-hmm. you had said, so people who are narcissistic and toxic, they're going to seek out specific individuals. So what, what kind of, what kind of things do you think that they seek out? People that will help them, support them, um, that are strong, believe it or not. They're mm-hmm. not looking for people that are weak because they're looking for people that are strong that can eventually tolerate them. That's one thing I noticed in my relationship is he would, he loved me for my strength and what I could do mm-hmm. and provide and be capable of. But he would like knock me down to the point to where I was weak and only ever kind of let you get back up to a certain point before you get knocked down. And that's part of the cycle and the pattern. Um, so yeah. Um, so yeah, they do look for people that are strong and have capabilities and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I have heard that they're not looking for somebody who is weak. So if people, if someone right now who is watching or listening to this and they're in a situation like this to please not feel that there's something wrong with you, that you're weak, you're actually strong. And that's why they you were targeted. Yeah. Cause they can Mm -hmm. kind of make you feel that you're, that's not the reason, you know, that you're weak or you're not that, but if you, they, like you said, they don't target that. Yeah. One thing that's came to mind in the last couple of days that I've been thinking about a lot is when you're in it, we can feel so weak mm-hmm. and broken and stuff and feel like th- if we got out, like, how are we going to cope? But one thing that's kind of been like a light bulb moment for me is when you take away all the energy that we've been putting into trying to make things work with them, it is amazing once you start doing the healing, the energy and what you're capable af- of after. So you're like way stronger and stuff than you think. It's just the relationship that is making mm-hmm. you feel like you're weak or you're broken and okay. feel ashamed or all the different things that you're feeling. Yeah, shame seems like a, a big one too. Like there's a lot of shame. You feel like, oh, it's my fault. Or right. I'm ashamed that I've been through this. Like, um, but it's it's not their fault. It's not their fault. No, that was a big thing for me. And it's actually something I've been touching on a lot lately is because I feel like it's probably the number one thing that blocks us from healing. Oh, okay. Overall, like if I look at all the things, um, well, if you look at the people that they don't get help or that they're struggling to work through our things, um, like for myself, the thing the things that took me the longest to touch on when I was healing were things that I was shamed about, like judging about myself, if that makes sense. So like it when it came to, so inner, that was where, that was actually the thing that won me over with inner child healing because, because I was finally able to see that these patterns and these things that triggers that were happening for me came from childhood and they developed before I was even conscious. Like in my mind, my brain was fully developed that I started doing these and why I developed these patterns, I had so much more compassion for myself. So it just slowly eroded all the shame that I had. And so if I got triggered or if something came up or if I was frustrated because maybe I was even like missing my ex-partner because mm-hmm. there was still like the cycle, like I was detoxing from it. All of a sudden I, I didn't have as much shame and I was able to actually go there and heal deeper and go further into the healing process. Thanks for saying that. And a lot, like you said, the, some of the shame is our own shame. We're judging ourselves. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, that's powerful. That's really powerful. And rather than, it's not as much about other people shaming us, it's us, us shaming ourselves. Wow. That's, that's super powerful. So mm-hmm. what would you say to somebody who's, who's in a relationship like this right now, uh, whatever type of relationship, what would you say to them to maybe spark some kind of a realization that they could leave? And that they are worth it. Oh, they are. And the other thing is, is like life on the other side of it can be so much brighter than you can even imagine. Like when I was in it, I couldn't even think of being able to like, I could think of, okay, I'll get out of it. But I just couldn't see myself ever being happy again because you just feel like your, your nervous system is just wrecked from it. It's just, it's, it's a mess. And so when I got out and I started healing, and I'm where I'm at now. And I look at it, life is like, like, I'm not exaggerating, like 10 times better than I could have even imagined. It's not like as good as before I got into it because of the healing that I've done. 
I'm in like a way better place than before I even got into the relationship. So yeah, you can definitely thrive after. And like I said, all that strength that you're putting into holding on and tolerating will go into your healing and thriving and living after. So yeah. Wonderful. Well, that's wonderful. And that's going to be so helpful just to, for them to hear what you've been through and then how it's just, you're, you're thriving now. Your life is vibrant and you've healed. Now healing is kind of, is, is not really linear. I'm sure there's always backsliding, of course. Exactly. Yeah. There's still layers of it for me. And that's the other thing I want to share too, is the longer you're like, I more than anyone else is going to be understanding about being stuck in it and how hard it is to leave. But the longer that you stay, the more layers of healing that you're going to have to do. Um, because I was in it for 15 years. I don't know, but my guess is that I will probably for most of the rest of my life, there will be things that will still come up for myself. Um, it's more subtle. It's not traumatic. It's but like maybe it's in a dream, you know, okay. or things like that. But like I would say overall, I'm like, you know, really, really good. But it's taken me it was like three years of deep, solid healing. Like that was my main focus. Like 75% of my life went into healing. Like I just kind of went right into it. Um, we always say like, take small steps and do a little bit at a time. But in my case, I had my own business and stuff. So it wasn't one of those things where I could like, I had people to assist me or I was surrounded by a lot of people that could help me. It was like, there was a lot of pressure mm -hmm. for me to heal enough to even run my business. Okay. Um, because when I first left my, I was diagnosed with um, CPTSD, mm -hmm. like a complex PTSD. And like, I couldn't even drive safely or properly. Like I would drive by a client's house five times in a row before I would like pull into the driveway, even though I'd been going there for years. Like my brain was just, it felt like mush for about six months it was really bad but because I was meditating like literally hours a day when I first left because I didn't know what else to do that like I said that was why it it saved my life because it just slowed me down and I know it healed my nervous system wonderful and that's wonderful and and yeah and a lot of people who have been in these relationships do get diagnosed with CPTSD mm -hmm. um it's like being in a war zone you know it's it's emotionally like it's a war you know and you're been through so much so people probably a lot of people who've been through this have probably have some sort of some form of that cptsd yeah and that's the thing is it's like i felt like at first i was like is my life over like we see movies and stuff like that where you know see people with like ptsd and it's like it's portrayed as awful and it is but what i'm saying is there are ways out of it you can heal from it it's a lot more possible than i think we know um if you have the right tools and the right support. So and it's not like a life sentence kind of thing. Good. And you also support people who have that as well. Yeah. Well, that's part of the inner child healing is uh -huh. what it is, is we have trauma stored in our body, right? So okay. it's clearing the, it's clearing the traumas that we have. And it's probably so cathartic for people. I mean, it's probably hard, but there's probably a lot of tears. It was probably just so cathartic just to feel like you can trust someone to let it out. Um, and then just, release it yeah oh it's been it has surprised me like when I first meet someone and sometimes I'm surprised even after like three or four sessions like the change in them just from a lot of it is just a few tools and support like I'll usually set them up with some tools to practice or whatever um and then we'll like touch base because of how deep the work is I don't normally like I do like weekly sessions, but we do a lot of like back and forth in between because as you know, or a lot of people might know, once we start healing, it just kind of keeps coming up and something really heavy might come up in between sessions, right? So I make sure like, that's what I say, creating a safe space. I wouldn't never want to like have someone have these really big triggered moments come up and not know what to do with them. Well, that's, that's wonderful that you offer all those tools for people. So where can people get in contact with you and, and work with you? What kind of a work, I guess it was mainly like first, I guess, what, how do you set up the sessions and how, how do people um, work with you? So the best place to get a hold of me is on Instagram through mm -hmm. mindful adventure coaching. Um, and I would say, send me a DM and just reach out. Um, 
I do provide like a free consult call for like 30 minutes. If anyone's interested, they just want to like know about how I can actually support them in like some of the ways and some of the tools that I share. So yeah, they can send me okay. a DM and reach out. Um, I also have a free guide. Um, it's a guide to leaving a narcissistic, narcissistic relationship. Um, and I've broken down like from what I learned from not being successful and being successful, I've broken down like a guide um, oh. that's free that people can check out on there too. So people can just send you a DM on Instagram and then they can also get the guide as well. And yeah, the, the guide is in my bio too, or they can DM okay. me and I can send it to them. Well, that's great. That's great. So mm -hmm. mindful adventure coaching, and that's on Instagram. And that's how you can get in touch with Paula and, you know, set up a free call to see if it's going to work for you and then, and then work with, with her. Well, that's so mm -hmm. great. And well, yeah. before I really appreciate you coming on, but I just wanted to say before we sign off, is there anything you would like to share with the people who are watching this or listening to this? Just that you're so much stronger than you feel like you are right now. Like I said, a lot of it is just what you're going through in your nervous system. Um, once your nervous system has a chance to heal and settle down a little bit, you are going to start to feel stronger. And any of the other things that you're feeling, it's, it's just from the relationship and the cycle and stuff like that. And you're not alone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's great. And that's really important to tell them too, that they're not alone. Cause a lot of you, it's, you can really feel alone. You can really feel alone in these kind of. It's very isolating Definitely. for sure. Definitely. Well, again, thank you so much, Paula, for being such a great guest. I really enjoyed this conversation. And everybody check her out, Mindful Adventure Coaching on Instagram. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you have a great rest of your day. You too.